Alright, welcome to a new episode of The Inner Game of Smash. This is, I think, our 23rd episode. I'm joined here uh, with with two of my best friends in the world. Uh, I've, got, I've got Howard here, Mr. Tuesday, represented hello, by hello. a bag tonight. I am Skyping a bag. Yeah, pretty much the, the hottest bag you'll ever see this side of Skype. And um, also Theo, uh, Squibble. Hello. I'm here. And we're joined tonight by... Um, by a special guest, the dashing gentleman before you, uh, streaming from Theo's usual seat is Blaye. How's it going, Hello. Keith? Uh, good. How are you guys? Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Hey, yeah, we, we've been wanting to pick your brain for a while, so thanks for uh, thanks for coming on the show with us. Yeah. So, how are you guys doing? How have your has your week been? How's the weekend? Yo, I've been following this hot news about the robot takeover, yes. the impending. Oh. Pending doom of humankind, okay. and I'm know. glad that no one's writing a melee bot right now because that thing would just crush everything. Melee Wait a minute, Howard. What's going on? Oh, yeah. Oh, you got, yeah. got him. <sighs> Pardon me while I choke on my drink. <laughs> but yeah, uh, for those of you that don't know, um, in other competitive gaming news, uh, the world has been taken by storm by. Um, the what is it called? Alpha Go beating the World Go champion. So uh, hopefully those people at Google don't start building AIs for other games because uh, I don't think Melee would stand a chance. Seriously, Do you think Mango, Mango would an easy bot. beat anyone the best of five? I don't think so. Yeah, you just make a power shield bot and you're done. That's so yeah. I don't know quite as much about like the Go scene as I would like, but from what I understood, um, Korea is one of the strongest scenes in the world. Uh, yes, alongside Korea. Korea and China are considered the strongest, but Korea is like unsurprisingly like amazing at Go. And one of their top players, uh, Lee So Dahl, um, had he was challenged by an AI. It was um, Google's Alphabot, and at the onset of the challenge, he was really he was like you know pretty sure that the intuition aspect of Go could not be mimicked by a machine, and that the elements of like human interaction and just the sense of like having a hunch or having a like a psychological read on someone that's something that like that he thought that machines could not imitate but um he lost the first game and, and then at that point i think he said that his um his confidence in that like and in that human intuition couldn't be replicated started to become shattered and now that now he's saying things like you know moving forward it's like 50 50 whether or not i even win so it's certainly very very interesting news from for both like competitive gaming on and also for like AI and, and computer science, so that was cool news. Yeah, actually, so, like tell my own horn for a second. I actually wrote a blog post like almost on this issue and like two of the issues that we're going to be talking about, um, specifically on uh, like different games and how long-term human competition will be influenced by artificial intelligence and computer developments um, between, like, Go and chess and a variety of video games. So, yeah. So, um, so, so, Keith, a question for you, Blaya. Um, how, how long do you, would take, do you think you would take a team of competent programmers that could make an unbeatable melee bot? About two hours. <laughs> two hours? I think <laughs> so, too. Maybe, maybe hours, a little longer. Maybe, like, two days, it, right? Like, eh, I don't think so. Do you really? So you just make something that... Uh, Power shields every attack and spot touches every grab, which is easy. And then you you're basically you just done. Play Fox and shine perfectly, right? Well, no, because then jump canceling gets more awkward. So I'd actually make it a power. I'd probably well, it depends because like in some cases you want a power shield. Do you probably just make it, like do a range? No, because the one frame invincibility on shine, so you can right. dodge grab. Um, that's true. Actually, yeah, you put yeah, you just want to shine instead of <laughs> spot dodge. Yeah, so you just make a fox. Well, I mean, yeah, and you you could just make a fox that shined or. Power shielded every every hitbox and then you're done. That's yeah. it. Take an hour. Fox is broken. Bad fox. <laughs> yeah, fox is pretty much broken. Yeah. <laughs> it's so bad. Yeah. Um, Although this is neither here nor there, but I heard that Yoshi would be actually the most OP because yeah. he has the best power shield. Yeah, you actually, know. um, Yoshi, uh, like whatever power shield Nair actually beats uh, Double Shine. Oh, really? So, yeah. Um, or actually, no, it's not. I don't think it's normal double shine. It's double shine after the second shine because of the <laughs> two extra frames. Um, so then so then actually Yoshi, Yoshi wins that interaction. Wouldn't, there, wouldn't it be like 
Captain Falcon spamming hack stash, basically, mixing up with ledge dash grab or something. Well, it, that, at that point, it gets com com computers against computers get com gets complicated, actually. But yeah. So, okay. against humans is simple. So, Keith, out of curiosity, I, I one of the reasons we kind of wanted to talk to you on the show was because you had, like, a much more broad sense of, like, competitive games apart from just, like, Melee. Um, and, and, you know, we've talked a little bit about chess before and also, like, other traditional board games like that. So, what can you give us a rundown of, like, which games have tra traditionally been considered solved and which games are sort of, like, on the forefront of being solved? Okay, so, I mean, basically just, like, Checkers is really the only one that's been solved um, of, like, popular games. Uh, I'm trying to think. I don't know. There's probably, definitely some others. How about chess? Chess is not solved. It never will be, but actually. But it's better. The um, bots are much are better. better than the best right. people. Right. So here, here's the thing with chess. So the way you want to think, I, I think about, and like, in artificial intelligence, the way this is analyzed is that there's a lot of games. So to fully solve a game, you need to basically have memory that holds every single state position in the game, which is like every position, every possibility in the game. So... Um, for a comparison point, the universe has approximately 10 to the 50th or so atoms. Like that's a ballpark. Um, chess has about 10 to the 40th state positions. So it's, um, it's about 60 for a 40 move game. 68, 10 to the 68. Yeah. It's yeah. really high. Yeah. And so, like, you're never, you actually, like, a computer of the universe could not really hold chess even. So chess will actually never be solved, but oh, we've yeah. already... Yeah, so we'll, but we're already hitting a point, and so actually Go is like even, even, even further. Go will never even come close, just because there's so many more state positions in Go. But we've already, obviously computers are already much stronger than chess. So what I think is actually the more interesting question than whether games will be solved, is how human competition is influenced by computer programs becoming stronger. So like, for example, in chess nowadays, um, I think that chess is sort of less creative and less interesting, or will sort of get pushed in that direction by the strength of computers because more and more of human play will basically be sort of replicating computer analysis. Um, so actually, what I think is really interesting about video games is that the ability to have real-time games instead of turn-based games eliminates that problem because reaction time and the need for reads versus reactions and mixing that up actually completely eliminates that problem because even though it's really easy to make computer programs, they will always be better than humans human competition will always be viable and distinctly a, like a different class, sort of. That's so cool. I didn't know that about chess, that um, it, it's not currently a solved game. I sort of assumed that it was with, like, Deep Blue in the 60s and 70s. But, um, yeah, that that's really, really cool, and I imagine Go would be even more complex than that. Um, yeah. From what I've heard, there are some other games that have been solved, such as Chinese chess. Um, it's, oh, I know that. I guess, like, the, the number of, like, viable strategies are... It's a bit more linear of a game, even though some of the rules are, like, comparably complex. But um, from what I had heard from my parents, like, you know, people oh. complain all the time about stagnant moves and stagnant strategies. <laughs> so, like, even oh, at, like, ping pong booths and stuff. So I'm sure there are... It, it's kind of interesting that, like, you know, the most com complex games are also, like, the most competitive in terms of, like, board games. Um, yeah. And, and obviously, like, the simpler you go, the more, like... You can figure out, like, the tic tac tac toe strategy, even if you've, like, never played the game before as a kid. And obviously with, like, games like War or Poker, like, you can figure out the odds of, like, you know, just simple interactions. But, yeah, like 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 you were saying, with, like, with games like Melee and fun games in particular, you're gated a lot more by time, which is, you know, not really something that has quite the same effect in other games. Like, you, you have the time to think, and, and definitely, like... If you have a if you have a timer, like it constrains you a little bit, but you know, like fighting games are seem to be built a lot more on like intuition and you know, getting a psychological read on your opponent rather than like processing everything in a super rational way. So one of the things to me that makes melee so beautiful is that the messiness comes out, and what um the person that comes out better of this, these messy situations. Is the better player almost all the time? Right. Like well, there's this nonsense that happens on the screen that you just your brain can't react to fast enough, and like it, that that kind of thing doesn't really happen in games like Go and chess, right? Like yeah. the better you get, the more clear things become. And that, while that's true in melee as well, there's always going to be a cap. You can never discreetly figure out what's going to happen next. And while like a computer can totally do that, like a computer is just a completely different class, like. Um, like like uh, Keith was saying, it's more interesting about how like a computer would inform the human play rather than directly competing against them. Mm 
That's like mm-hmm. the. I think that's one of the fundamental. Di- that is the fundamental difference between a board game and yeah. um, a game like Smash, right? Mm-hmm. It's yeah. that there's no time element in in a board game the way there is in in a game like a fighting game like that. Yeah. Yeah. When I've done a little bit of writing about this past, that's actually almost the exact like division I draw is I, I basically classify games into discrete versus continuous games. Mm. Um, even though every game is theoretically discrete, you know, um, but obviously... Because you like, make one input right. every 60th of a second. Yeah, so every game's like theoretically discrete, but clearly games like Melee and most fighting games are continuous comparatively yeah. to <laughs> games like Chess and Go. And so continuous games versus discrete games, um, like all discrete games, I think, can be sort of will reach a point where computers can be stronger than humans. It feels intuitive, and and so that human play will will then have to be informed by computer play. Mm-hmm. But in continuous games, human play will always be distinctly different. Mm-hmm. Which can mm-hmm. make the uh, learning from a computer much more interesting, right? Because in chess, it's all about you basically yeah. just plug moves into a computer analysis. And you memorize more and more things. I mean, that's simplifying. It's it, right? simplifying it, but yes, I get that's that's saying. actually pretty much how world class preparation goes. <laughs> it's, it's starting to get there. It's starting. It's starting to, to approach that point. Yeah. Whereas, like in melee, maybe you learn a new combo, right? But right. then you have to still you still have to learn the execution, know when to use it, and there'll be some kind of counter, and you have to be able to do that in a split yeah. second reaction. And you have to know which, like, in the middle of the combo, whether parts of it would have to be a read or reaction based on your personal mm-hmm. reaction time as well. Yeah. And so there's a constant different set of interactions. Uh, so so we're, we've talked a little bit about how games like that are very different, right? Like chess and Go are very different than games like Smash. But um, I, for those of you that don't know, Keith was a pretty high-level competitor at, um, at school, Scholastic Level Chess back in the day. Um, and, and other games, of course. But um, so, so what would you say is the overlap in the competitive mindset that, that like, would you say that being good at one will help you be good at another in any sense? So I think it actually changes a lot based on different games. I will say, I think, um, so I guess to give a little background, I've, I basically have played mainly three games competitively in my life. Chess, um, and then I was like, I don't say it, don't serious. say it. I was Don't very serious it. League of Legends player. Oh, for you said it! <laughs> um, I was on like a top 25 team in North America for a couple years, and then we all got too busy, so I started playing melee. Um, <laughs> the right choice, but, by the way. The right choice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, I think there's definitely some things that, a lot of things carry over. I think one of one big benefit to me was that I had a very formal learning in chess, and so that sort of taught me how to learn games, is that I, I sort of had this background in you know, how to dissect a game, how like how to create a value system, and, and what sort of things you should prioritize. How do you uh, dissect a game? Yeah, that sounds fascinating, Keith. I'd love to hear more. Um, so, well, actually, I guess to go into, I think it really depends on your learning style, which is something everyone has to figure out individually. You know, um, Howard and I have actually talked about this a lot uh, in terms of like our personal learning styles, mm-hmm. um, and that so. Uh, Howard, you can always talk about this, you know, for yourself too. But I feel like Howard is much more a person who sort of sees like specific situations, and he sort of he likes to sort of you know find what the boundaries of a game are, and and sort of you know learn by sort of that exact I don't know like the exact maximum and minimums. In you mean like nearest per second? Yeah, I like I like yeah. situations where there's a couple of discrete possibilities, and trying to figure out it like it could be complicated. But if there is enough that I can calculate, I'm pretty good at picking the best one. Meanwhile, Keith's learning style is very different and much more open-ended, in a way. Yeah, I sort of just, I don't know, I'm much more personally, I sort of look at a general situation and I just sort of, I, I just sort of let my intuition run, almost. I don't really try to, even just kind of funny because even though I know a lot of random frame data in melee, I don't really use it at all. To play. <laughs> I'm not really the person that... Yeah, yeah, frame data is, is good to know, but it's usually something that helps you, like, outside of a match. In the middle of a right. match, like, you have to already yeah. have known something, and while reviewing a match, like, after the fact, it helps you understand situations, but in the, in the middle of, like, a match, it really is is generally quite trivial. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And so, I guess, I guess for me, um, yeah, just I think I learned the importance of just drilling important situations. Like, when I, when I played League, as a good example, I, uh, you know, I had a friend, and we would just sit there and drill specifics in theorycraft lane matchups for like hours. We were really, really good at it. We understood, you know, like that's an important thing that will have an influence on the game. And you need to drill the important things. 
even if they're boring. Wait, so just off the top of my head, if I just proposed matchups for, like, Season 2 champions, you would probably, like, have good ideas of, like, how they would go and, like, what kind of cheese strats, you know, would be available and what what kind of things would give you slight edges, things like that? Yeah, yeah, honestly, like, because I was also a super lane specialist, and so, like, I don't know, I honestly, like, I wasn't as good at the rest of the game, but I felt very comfortable in lane against pretty much any, like, in top lane against any player in the world, pretty much, I'd say, during, like, late season two. Cool. And so, that was sort of, like, my specialty. And so, you know, for example, I think in Melee, that was sort of something where, once I decided I was going to take Melee a little more seriously, it was like, okay, you need to, like, there's a lot of things you just need to drill out. And I think, yeah, I guess this is sort of branching off a little bit, but I think especially recently as Melee's gotten bigger, there's been a lot of conversation about, you know, how people should practice and how people get good at Melee. And I think there's a lot of emphasis on sort of, I don't know, I feel like sometimes people are like, oh, you need to do this to get good at Melee. I don't think that's really true, because I think you need to get a lot of basics down, but I think people should also tailor their learning to their own learning styles. Um, so so I have a question for Theo, actually. Um, so I know that um, no one here and no one listening, and pretty much no one in the world has ever had a formal Melee teacher, right? Like, a lot of us had <laughs> piano teachers growing up. And so well, also gave his... His lessons for the first time on... Yeah, he did. Oh, yeah. And um, I believe it was Yat and um, Kunai, who were the first yeah. student people. So, so yeah, props to them. So um, I guess as of Saturday, what I just said is no longer true. But until then, it was. So, um, so there's never been like a formalized training regimen that people have. People that think like, oh, I'm going to practice this this week and practice this the next week. And like they kind of haphazardly become better players in that sense. Like, look at Mango getting good. Mango didn't get good because he, like, wanted to do things. He just, like, oh, this is cool, I'm gonna practice this. And then, he did, I disagree. but he, he tries to give the public persona that I don't he think, didn't. I don't even think he does. I think other people give it to him more. Like, did you li- listen to the DJ Mir stores? Uh, DJ Mir stores? Stories. Stories. Can't, oh, don't know there why we go. <laughs> <laughs> the hard word. Yeah. It's a um, tongue twister. DJ okay, so Mango is, Mango is a fraud of a fraud, then. He's just secretly no, he just, a child. No, he tweets. Oh, no. He, I remember he was like, everyone was like, oh, Shield Drop is really good, and he didn't want to do it for a long time. And then he was like, oh, Shield Drop is amazing. And he tweeted about, man, never thought I'd reach this day, but I just did like 600 Shield Drops in a row. Like, he tweets about it. He yeah. practices. <laughs> he practices. Okay, so like, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. Every every top player practices. We already knew yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, uh, with Mango, uh, but, there's but, like, there's no clear recipe for success and I don't, I don't think there's like any one thing that he chose to do you know that differentiated himself that much more than other players it's sort of like the whole package right like if you if you look at any of all the top players like you'll be able to point out like macro things that they're really good at right like armada has the quote unquote the clutch right he can force bad situations and he can recognize bad situations more than almost any other almost any other player mago can he's notorious for being able to like sniff out blood and know when people are cracking and when people are like on their back foot, he attacks relentlessly. And Mutsu okay, can so obviously like force every, edge every situations. Every player has their strengths for sure. Right. But, uh, the question I wanted to ask Theo is: I think you're one of the people with one of the best practice regimens of anyone that I've met in person. So I want to wanted to ask you: like, if you had a student, so to speak, how would you get them to to like what what would your formalized training regimen be for that student? And like, what would that look like? Because it would be different for every person. But I'm, I'm curious to hear what your idea of how to get good fast would be. Well, so my experience with, like, formalized one-on-one training is all music lessons. And I've done guitar lessons and flute lessons. I found the most important thing for learning was the student actually caring. <laughs> so that's step okay. number one. Because you learn so much more if the student is dedicated to the plan and really wants to improve. And they can't just have this far off idea of they want to improve, maybe it would be nice. They have to actually be dedicated because if not, like you can, the teacher can tell the students something, but they have to be motivated enough to go practice by themselves for a week before meeting up again. And I don't, I mean, I guess ideally in the future you have a coach that lives with you and forces you to practice for 16 hours a day. But I don't know if Melee will get to that point for a little while. Yeah, league though. Yeah, <laughs> league is That's there. like like the the North Korea strats right there. Yeah. The uh, you get good at cello or else. But the whole point of a teacher is to try and save time, basically, right? Because when you're by yourself, 
you you have the tools to learn a lot of things. I mean, not always. There's some things you just can't. You well, I don't want to say that. I just some things will take much longer for you to figure out than if someone points it out for you. So, like, if you're a fox, you might be doing bad nares and getting crouch canceled for them, but you might not really understand what's happening as you do it, and your coach will be able to explain it to you very quickly, and then you understand. So you get this kind of personalized, very direct learning. So it should help you save time, and you can focus your practice to be more direct, which I think is useful. Um, mm. But they can't really create the motivation, I think, and I think that's really important to get a lot out of your tears. I think that having a good teacher doesn't just save you time. Like there, there are literally things that you won't be able to figure out unless you have like an alternative perspective, right? Like sometimes like elements of your play are predicated on certain like suppositions, and until they're challenged like hard enough by someone who thinks differently or knows differently, you know, you'll hold on to like these same kind of ideas. What I mean by that is like, let's say you, like, we're, we're playing melee by yourself in Nova Scotia or none of it, and you were literally, you literally were just shipped there with the GameCube, and you were told to like learn melee over the course of like ten years, and you could play melee for like ten hours a day or something, and that was that was that was your life. You had like airdropped packages of food. <laughs> <laughs> you you wouldn't You'd be the best player in the world, of course. Right? You wouldn't. So, you I would not. So I don't think it's possible so to, to become like a professional or to, to reach the highest levels in isolation anymore. And that's why having a teacher and having someone who is like traveled and worldly, it does save you a lot of time, but it also like, you need someone to like, to force you to challenge your own beliefs about the game, right? I, I don't think you can learn Go or chess or, or Melee uh, and get to like an extremely high level just by playing by yourself anymore. Hmm. I mean, why wouldn't we just play CPUs then? Like, those yeah. days are over. Well, yeah, you definitely need some human input, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I don't think... I think it is, like... Like, obviously, it's possible to become very good at that much human input. It's just obviously, like... Like, I think there are examples of players who improve very quickly without a lot of good players near them, particularly like, in Melee, right? Like Ice is, Ice is a good example of that. He's the only notable yeah, yeah. player in Germany, and he... He's so CPUs good! All the time. <laughs> he's so and he's good. so good! But at the same time, he's not the best, right? For large periods of time, like, Cactuar hasn't had anyone to play against for, you know, for a good portion of his, his melee play. But these players talk. That's the thing, like, yeah. right now they're not geographically striated. So, like, being geographically striated doesn't hamper them as much as as it could. Um, they're I don't know if this box. is... Yeah, I don't know if this is true for other games, but I feel like, especially in, like, games where knowing technology and knowing, like, the nuanced interactions of certain specifics in games, um, there is no substitute uh, to, like, actual just, like, interaction and, and asking around. Pretty much, like, I don't know if this is true for you guys, but, like, pretty much every single day of the week when I'm at a computer or at home or in some setting where I have access to, like, Facebook or something, I will be talking about Melee and I will be, like, trying to figure things out about, like, matchups or characters. It's just what happens, right? And I'm sure you guys, like, in Boston see each other and... and do that kind of thing in person. Oh, we hate each other. We never play with each other. You're not missing out on anything. <laughs> By being isolated in New Hampshire. <laughs> you shouldn't feel bad at all. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Thanks, Howard. <laughs> no problem. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, so, I, I, so I, something that I've been thinking about was... Um, what was it? So um, Tri-State has been coming up a little bit more to... Uh, Massachusetts, a little bit out of that. We're no, we're no longer getting stuck in our box. Um, what was it? Uh, the the first first out of region tournament ever for one of the the strong players. Uh, was it? It was Rio Beat, right? Yeah, yeah, my boy Nico. Shout outs to Rio Nico. Beat. Nice. I know you went down to play him a couple of times, and um, Diz, of course, um, came up. Smuckers. So a, a lot of really good players that we don't see very often, and they came to Mass Madness last week. Oh yeah. Um, so so. Big elephant out of the room. Mass Madness this week was ridiculous. Like, so what the heck happened? Like, oh my what happened? god! Wild. Pretty much when when bracket was starting, like literally anything and everything could have happened and what did happen. Happened? What a crazy tournament! So, so, so rather oh than even breaking god, down like weird. individual numbers, like just the kind of matches that we got to see and the kind of like matchups and just like if you if you did nothing. 
but just went to Mass Madness just to watch the matches that were on stream, you would have learned so much about Melee. It was an insane experience. So, um, shoutouts to our very own Calvar for upsetting, for I think is the upset of the tournament. There were a couple of contenders for that, but he actually took the set from Ryobi 2-0. And, like, there, there are some factors there, like, Rio Beats never played outside of Tri-State and whatnot, but, like, that, I think Peach has been a problem matchup for him, and he really brought it to Rio Beats, so shout-outs to him, that's really impressive, because, um, Rio Beat, if you don't know, is a really good Peach, I think, considered by many to be around Mafia's level, so, yeah, that was, that was insane, and, like, yeah. he's got the they were... player, or New England players as well, just crazy. I think Rio Beat got thumbs, thumbs and went Connecticut, Connecticut, Wait, oh, yeah. Connecticut. Thank you, Thumbs. Do you remember Crazy. that free win? <laughs> oh, yeah. Th oh, my God. Because <laughs> oh. yeah, cause Thumbs beat him. Diz kid was great. Yeah, and then Lint beat him in I... losers, and so Diz got, like, 25th. It's crazy. Oh, that's, yeah. Wait, Diz got 25th? Yeah, I think that he is got insane. There's, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's, that's gotta be, like, the upset of the tournament then, right? Diz was seated, so like, second or something. Crush got 17th. Did Crush, Crush was there? No, the previous one. Oh, yeah. yeah. Crush got, even Crush got 17th. Oh, he got 25th. He got 17th. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, some things I want to, I want to, some things I want to point out about Mass Madness was the fact that, like, you know, we've talked about this on the show a little bit, and I've seen, I've been like a naysayer for a long time about like New England actually getting good. I spent a lot of time like talking to people at the venue, and the unanimous agreement by all the players was that like this was an in insanely hard tournament. Like. Smuckers came in and he's like, dude, like this is not even the same New England I visited six months ago when I just came to New Game Plus Damn. and whooped everyone, right? I mean, that was <laughs> that was another New Game Plus where I think I think the gatekeeper of that tournament was either Crush or Slox. But this time around, he 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 did not win like our tournament, right? He, he I think he ended up getting second, but he did not win. That's very telling. Second of all, like Discord Boogie, I think would have been favored like to win the tournament even over Smuckers. And he ended up getting like trounced by like you know, just strong Connecticut players, and you know that that's really, really telling to me. Like, I know it's one result, but it's it's still like you know reflective of the fact that we're starting to do some good stuff, and I'm starting to have like a lot more confidence about how well our players would do against like out of region threats. Disco Boogie is like melee anomaly top 100, and I think quite deserved. That guy's been traveling so like to so many so, states, so, so many regions. That's a, th that's a, those are some huge upsets. Something I think that about um, New England is that while well, our top top talent doesn't necessarily stack um, up with like this the the likes of Florida who has a standout player in Hungry Box and like Flop. maybe um, like yeah, Flop, yeah. right? and Cobol and Wizard yeah. and Gus. We have like a couple of super Box standouts. And also he's better than like all our good players. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah and but there's it, a lot of uh, regions with a couple of super high standouts. But I think that in the recent polling, I don't know if you call it polling or what it, stats gathering, whatever Matt Dodd does with his number <laughs> crunching, um, it's shown that there's been no other area with as much explosive new growth than New England. And I think that's a, a large factor of the college scene. I think that's a large factor um, b between Big Blue Esports and the work that Matt Dodd has done and the, the kind of growth of the scene in particular. But I think that people, the your average mid-layer level player in New England is super hungry. That's why you see players like Lint and um, and Thumbs going, coming all the way from Connecticut um, to to tournaments like fairly re uh, like reasonably regularly. Like we see Doom and other players like that come up to uh, Massachusetts to to compete with uh, the Bostonians, and I think that's really good. And it shows it's indicative of of just how much people want it here. And I think that's only going to continue to to show dividends against um, top top threats from other regions. So I'm gonna say something like slightly callous, and it's that sometimes when you play against players who are like, you know, who are not as good as you, or who you think are not as good as you in friendlies or something, you sometimes just get the sense that you know, you cannot think and you can beat them, in the sense that you know you could just press buttons, you could just like force your will upon them, and there's nothing really that they can do to, oh, to threaten you. I think that all the time. You sometimes think that, right? Like, you know, you'll play against someone and you'll just say that, you'll, you'll sort of say that it's not that much of a mental challenge and you can just throw moves and eventually they'll die. So, on the flip side, you know, sometimes you plug in against players who aren't quite there yet, but you see sparks of, like, ingenuity and creativity in their play. Like, I've, you know, that's something that I definitely keep note of. And even if, like, a player isn't getting results yet, you, you can, like, mentally take a note and be like, this guy's, like, onto some, like, really interesting strategies. Like, this guy, like, 
does some really cool stuff. Like they force you to rethink, you know, your assumptions, and they also like you can really see that they can get far if they push certain ta tactics. Um, I felt that way about a lot of New England players more so than ever before, like in the last year. In playing against players like Calbar, for example, I feel like Calbar has like what it takes to be like a huge regional threat given like a year or two. There are some things that he understands about like shield pressure and like baiting that none of our other players really do. And I think that the fact that Marth is like a slightly underrepresented character in our region forces you to be creative and like not just look at what Zoso does as like the only like the end all be all for, for the Marth metagame. Other players like I, I feel like Bonfire like really push like the defensive metagame of Sheik really far. And you know, you, you have guys like Tazio and like even PJ who like just when you see what they're doing on screen, you're like, wow, like I would not have thought to do this and like this was creative and effective. Like this is not just bond pressing. Like there's you know, there's I, I can really appreciate like that that spark of greatness in their play. Even if someone gets like force docked or something, if you see like them, you know, if you see the potential of like growth and stuff, like I love seeing those kind of players end up taking names in like half a year or one year's time. So shout outs to New England. All, all the guys like who are hungry and like who want to get good in New England, you guys should definitely keep at it. Yeah, so Mass Madness was, was was freaking insane. How like how are your experiences there? Like <laughs> um, uh, We're all trapped in like so a they seated RL above oh me gosh. for no good reason. Oh like, my I god RL every time we play. And I outplaced him, so it was a good mass madness. I was sad because I lost to RL and losers. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, I did I, not have a winning streak versus Peaches before that. I think it's okay <laughs> not to be like too like anecdotal or, or experience based. Like, I can accept the fact that RL has strong wins against players who are like better than me. It like the head to head matters, but like I feel like after a certain point, if they can beat people that you can't beat, like sometimes it's just like like a player block or a mental block. I, I think that seating was a little bit funky for this Mass Madness. It was. Yeah. Just because it was so... They did some last-minute shuffling because of yeah. the sheer volume of players that showed up. By the way, not record-breaking. That still goes to February's Mass Madness, but pretty close, right? Second largest Mass Madness at 150-something. Yeah. I think that... Crazy. Crazy. Yeah, 155. Crazy. Like, like, what just, was it? This doesn't matter for anything, right? But people showed up anyway. Uh, it's there was amazing. a regional, um, like wow. a, a like a super regional somewhere else. This is like this is a, any any mass madness that happens every month, but a super regional with like a, some top talent. I, I don't remember the names particular. I think it was Get on My Level. Um, oh, yeah. Considered to have some really good players there. Had like 120 pe 110 people. <laughs> That's a good yeah. New yeah. So damn. Like, well, this was this is a, this is still not as hard of a tournament as Get on My Level. Like it, it's that's true. That's. But so I think that of my level was like maybe like 120 people. Like you had guys like Music King Mango and Hbox at the top. Yeah. <laughs> but and like, like we did Kaze. not have Mango at our tournament. Yeah, I, <laughs> what like either Abu or I was gonna get 17th for that tournament. <laughs> yeah, and he just said like ridiculous. Like like yeah, it was it was super hard. But um, I, you know like new uh, like Mass Madness I think is starting to get back to the point where it's like a super super legit tournament where it's like not even a slouch to get into, like, top 16 and, like, like a huge honor to get into top 8. So this was about as hard as Boston, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Some other upsets to, to talk about, by the way. Like, Schwinkeldorf, like, had a crazy run. I think he ended up getting, like, yeah. fifth or seventh. Yeah, seventh. Oh, really? Yeah, Schwinkeldorf and has had two crazy... Eric, he's so good. He beat... He's been... I just want to say, because I've, I've been paying a little attention. <laughs> he has had some crazy wins. He beat, he beat J-Flex at Bust. Oh, wow. He beat J-Flex and Loser. So on, on Marth, right? Yes. J-Flex got 17th at Bust because right. of because of Shrinkledorf. Um Last time he beat Crush. Uh, and then yesterday, yeah, go on. He had a, he had a crazy beat Crunch, run. right? Yeah, he beat Crunch. He beat, um, he beat, actually, he also beat uh, GSO, who's a super yeah. old school Fox, who's so oh, good. Yeah. He's he from Upstate. Yeah. Yeah. And he beat, like, someone else really good, too. He had, a, he had an amazing run. Yeah, and, and there are some, I think, numbers also got upset by, um, I forgot how his bracket was like, but... Yo, all the ICs got wrecked. Yeah, Yo. Q-Puff <laughs> lost to, like, um, Lemon and stuff, so, like, yeah. that that's really, that, I think that's honestly a really good sign. It means that, you know, like, what's happening from tournament to, to tournament isn't really stagnant, and, you know, like, there's, there's huge swings, and there's also, like, huge variability, and to be able to emerge 
out of all that chaos and still be like consistently placing, that is really convincing. So the fact that like players like Mafia and Claps are still rising to the top, that's really telling. It's not just like you know, like who you're fighting, it's the ability to like beat all of these crazy, yeah. like hungry young players. Okay. I have two questions for Blaya, actually. Um, so I know that you've been holding off on traveling too much to going to tournaments. So um, one question is, um, with like, I mean, I guess one tournament a week is still a lot, but for how many tournaments we have in Boston, it's not quite as much as it could be. I know that some people are really fiending and going to like four tournaments, five tournaments a week, which is like insane to me, but the, the reality yeah. of the situation. So one question is, how do you stay sharp and make sure you keep up with everyone else um, that are feeding as hard when you don't get to play with other people as often? Um, and um, uh, Yeah, go on. Well, let's answer this question first. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess like recently I've just been busier because I've been like looking for a job. So I've been super busy with that. <laughs> uh, so I like haven't really been playing with people outside of like a tournament a week. Um, I try to obviously varies depending on my work ethic and how busy I am. I try to practice like an hour every day or so. Um, and I, I just, I think about the game, I also just, I just watch so much Melee. I, I don't, I've probably watched like 4,000 hours of Melee or something <laughs> ridiculous. Like, like I've watched so much Melee, so I just watch a lot. And so a lot of time when I'm playing, it's more of like, it's always just like, I think this is always true for me, and my hands are just sort of always behind mentally what I want to do. And so every time I'm playing, it's more of just like, I've always, like, I try and go into every time I play with, like, a, I want to work on this, I want to implement this thing that I've watched and now understand, but I, I suck at doing. Um, yeah. I guess, I don't know, that's kind of it. I also feel like, I don't know, I feel like people don't really practice Melee very well, so people can keep up without practicing that much, to be honest, if you design your practice well and, like, pay attention. And what do you think people do badly, then? Uh, I do think... I don't know, I think it is a sort of classic one that's been talked a lot. It's just like constant playing friendlies unless you're going in with a specific mm -hmm. thing to out of practice. Like you shouldn't be playing friendlies to win constantly and having that be your main source of practice because that's just not a good long term <laughs> learning style. Um, <laughs> um yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't do that guys. We don't none of us do that. None of us wanna win all the Oh my god, it's Melvin well. Howard and Theo so many times. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's, you know, I don't think that's an effective way. Like, I don't think it's the, the fastest way to learn things. So it's like, you know, today I got the chance to play with Theo a bit. So I came over and I was like, okay, I suck at edgeguard, but because I'm a nerd, I've watched Mewtwo King's 1001 Chic Edgeguard's videos the yeah, entire please. way through yeah. twice. I've watched it twice <laughs> because I'm a nerd. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to go in and all I'm going to focus on today is edgeguards. That's not so bad. I work on edgeguards. That is my homepage. Don't worry about it. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Ted. I feel better about myself. <laughs> yeah, so I guess making the relations. They're gods, like the oh uh, my god, it's so every two thousand fifteen so Edgeguard. Thank you, every thank you for this. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I guess I guess that's sort of my my general answer to that question. Um, I think a lot of other people have sort of talked about that 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 corresponding mm -hmm. issue a lot as well. So okay. Um, so the other question I had was. You're obviously taking some time out of Melee to sort out the rest of your life, as is was we all should do from now and then. Um, <laughs> like, we can devote our lives to Melee, but, you know, just a little bit, like an hour a day for something else. So, uh, do you ever feel, uh, like, a major difference when you go into a tournament and you, you just don't feel ready versus, like, oh, I have all my stuff together, I'm here because... I set out to do all the things that I need to do, and I'm here. Like, what what do you think the do you think there's value in that, and and do you feel like there's a difference? Yeah, I think there's a massive amount of value in that. Actually, I think that is sort of the effects of stress on hum like the human like mind and performance are pretty well studied, and it's a huge negative influence. And so the the better job you do of clearing up the rest of your life and sort of like. And just sort of having your having your life together and be, it, like it allows you to focus. So you're, you're not even if you're not consciously thinking about other things. I think subconsciously having other stress in your life makes you play worse and and inhibits your ability to learn. And I think this is a pretty well studied thing. And I think um, especially one thing that I did pretty consistently for a few months and I'm, now I've been slacking at because I'm busy and for various reasons is I would keep a um, like a tournament log where every time after I'd go home uh, from a tournament. 
I would just like brain dump like a paragraph or two about every set I played, and none of it was allowed to be about my play or anything that anything that happened like on screen during the set. The only thing I could write about um, was sort of how I emotionally responded to things and what I was thinking about and how I was feeling during the set. And I think, and then at the end of that, I'd make a like a summary. I'd make a bunch of bullet points, and I'd say, okay, these are I think the things like these are this is what was going on today. And then I'd sort of, you know, so this I realized, like, oh, okay, one of my big problems is tournament nerves, and then I get distracted and think too much, too results-oriented about things outside of the game during the game. And so I started through, like, week to week, I could track how my thought processes were during games and develop strategies to work on that. So, like, while my nerves problems were bad, I realized that there's, like, nerves, I think, have sort of two issues, and one of them is, like, the mental part of the nerves. The second is that when you get nervous, you have literal physical symptoms, like your heart rate increasing and things like that. And so I would, like, close my eyes and spend five to ten seconds taking deep breaths before every game just to, like, slow down my heart rate. And I found that was actually very effective for me. Um, and, you know, just, like, things like that, and then I, like, trace that week to week. Um, and so I think doing things like that is actually very helpful. Um, yeah, and I, I really, I really think, you know, like, uh, I <laughs> talking about, about this earlier, how we're sort of related, I think it's just a good example of this, how one of the biggest inhibitors on cognitive function is poverty, I think is actually a pretty well-studied phenomenon in society. And I think that's a pretty good example of how outside stress um, really influences your, mm -hmm. you can influence your performance in anything. And so I think sort of taking care of those other things and making sure that you're going in with a clear mind is really, really important. So be rich and get your shit together. You heard it here first. <laughs> Being rich is like the first step. Or just yeah. be good at melee. Just right. get rich and you'll be good at melee, guys. Well, you could pay Mewtwo King for private lessons, right? Oh I God. bet you Mewtwo King's been playing better melee now that he has like stable income. Yeah. You know that he's totally. dying of like hunger. Whatever. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He can eat. And if I don't now. get, if I don't yeah. win today, I, I won't be able to pay for that banana that I took from that guy's house. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not like he was going to pay for that anyway. Oh yeah, God. you're. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it's so he could buy a second banana later. We all heard yeah. that hey, Chris story from the dog. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> Sorry. Go on, Tim. So, so Keith, and I guess like for everyone else too, like this is something I have like some personal feelings about, but how do you feel about anger as a motivator for competition? Ooh. Okay, I actually, I think I have it. Uh, I, I, uh, I don't like it. I will say, I don't know, I understand it, and I definitely get angry occasionally too, but um, I don't know. I also think, for me, it's not all about, like, how good we are as a game. I think, I think sometimes people just get this is related, like, too salty after and during tournament matches to the point where, I don't know, it just, like, makes me embarrassed, like, as a society and, like, as a community. Like, honestly, I think I think that, like, it's okay to be angry, but I think everything, like, I think an important part is that your anger has to always be internal because I think anger is also, as a motivator, there's, like, a very fine line of any external anger is not going to help you improve. And internal anger can help you improve, but you also have to make sure that you don't get too down on yourself because that also will influence yourself. Right. I think it's That's a very delicate That's depression balance. then, right? Instead of just anger. That's I think so. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say. I think it, I don't. I don't. I don't really feel comfortable saying it's any one or the other. I think it's pretty ill-defined. Because the thing that's good with anger is it gives you energy, right? And you can channel that into productive into productive habits. A lot of people will use the destructive elements, use it to throw their controller, go run in circles, and then complain to their friends for 12 hours. But yeah. You could also channel it into practicing, right. into yeah. watching your VODs. Yeah. Which you're... Like, when I lose badly, I have to watch the VOD, like, three oh, times I so before I can learn anything from it. it and the first so three bad. times, it's just accepting that I was an idiot oh my God, and that so this all happened. But now it's okay, and I can watch it, like, a few more times to actually learn things. I, yeah. I completely agree. I think that there's... A lot of value in harnessing your emotions. Um, in particular, anger is one of the most powerful emotions we all feel playing melee against some scrub who beat us. <laughs> that we all have. But like, it's like I think to think of using your anger like you know the Sith lords from Star uh, Star Wars, right? Like you have you have the people who use their anger to great effect, like Darth Vader, and you have maybe someone who's a little more impotent about it, like Kylo Ren, right? <laughs> Don't be Kylo Ren. Don't don't just like. What are these you. subtle jabs at Star Wars? God, oh God, what a <laughs> jerk. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I get that. I I still think there's a point where I don't know. 
I, I think you have to be very careful with anger, and then it can mm-hmm. be, and then it can be effective. But like, it's hard. It's hard to be like. I don't know. Sometimes you just want to kill them, right? Like. Well, that's bad. Like, come on, guys. We're also people first. We're like human beings. And I'm, I'm not like on the screen, not society. in real life. Okay. Like, All right. you, if you actually want to kill them in real life, yeah, but like, I don't know. I think I think we have occasionally like I don't know too much too much anger and salt. Like, there was recently the issue of like someone probably punching a wall and make money off nailing and breaking something. Like that stuff's not okay. You know, like yeah, I don't do that. Yeah. yeah, you know exactly. And so I think I think in any discussion about anger, particularly in the, in a, the community where there are issues with it, I do think it has to also be discussed in like a certain context. But yeah, so I feel like anger is um, like one of the worst things that you can have during a match, and that following the results of a match, like external anger, is just it's just like another like form of johnning really saying like i can't believe this happened right and you're sort of making a spectacle of yourself to proclaim how how little you're accepting the results when i think the more mature thing to do is just to you know like to reflect on it and accept that it happened sometimes you need that right but it's sort of like part of being a good person to like not allow your needs to bleed into other people's experiences so um one of the things i actually disagreed with the inner game of tennis the most is the concept that anger can be a powerful motivator if you can control it. Because I think that's just a little naive and a little, like, you know, that's certainly not going to be true for everyone. If, you, if you're if you fueled by anger and you just, like, really want to beat someone as a reflection of, like, the negativity in your life, like, maybe that just means that, like, they weren't, you know, reasonable opponents in the first place and that you'll just be, like, a bit of an asshole in their eyes for taking it out on them. I don't think there's too much to be said about, like, being blinded by anger and wanting to beat people purely based on anger. If you make people impatient, and I'm sure that like Theo knows a lot about this, like people make mistakes more, and they tend to be either more stubborn or just more predictable. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I completely agree. Yeah. Um, it's really hard to get a good feel on your emotions sometimes. Sometimes you're angry without even realizing it too. Um, yeah. It's it's really tricky, right? Like, um, I'm actually gonna use. Uh, I was playing friendlies earlier today, and I went on tilt, and I realized I was I went on tilt, right? But I like when I was driving home later, um, I didn't realize how on tilt I was because I just didn't want to follow the speed limit. I saw these other cars. I'm like, man, look at all these jerks. And I was like, <laughs> on tilt from t- tilt from melee. And like, obviously, nothing bad happened. But I was like, when I thought about that, I'm like, wow, I, it, like I must have been playing really badly if this is my thought process now doing this reasonable thing. <laughs> yeah. um, like, it's 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 easy to get stuck in these traps. And like, I, I completely agree with Tian. Like. If you can harness your anger and you're that kind of person with that kind of control, that's great for you. But I think there's a lot of people that that just doesn't work out for, and they have to figure out alternative methods like, I don't know, yoga or breathing. It it seems like such a contradictory thing to say, like, you can control your anger. I don't think you can, because, like, anger is such a basal emotion. It's, It's so, like, reflexive. So, like, saying that, you know, I can use this anger and allow it to, like, access, like, my finer cognitive functions... I, I don't buy into that, so... I, I think you have to trick yourself. I don't think you can go at, like, level one and just think, I'm angry, I'm gonna not be angry. I don't think people work You can like be motivated that. without being angry. Yeah. But I, I think you'll need to do something, like, on a higher level to, you know, breathing exercise or whatever people do for anger management classes. I don't know. Um, just figure something out to, to get... Not, not be in the place where you play bad, right? Like, that's what it's all about. It's, it's getting to the place where yeah. you know you can play well. Actually, can I add add something on? I think that connects. Um, yeah, sure. Go right ahead. So, I think something that I do that I also then realize actually that Plup also does, and I've heard people talk about this a bit, is that when something really stupid and s- just so dumb and frustrating happens in a game, I try. I've like trained myself to like slightly laugh and smile. Even though I'm so salty about it. <laughs> In the inside, all there is is pain. Oh my god! Right, but but, but the but the point is, it's it's part of like a fake it till you make it thing, where even when it's frustrating, if you smile and laugh at it, the it actually like it actually tricks yourself a little bit into not being as salty about it. And so I think that like doing like that's one mental trick I use. I've like trained myself to do to try and maintain having a more of a level head during my sets. And I noticed that Plupwise does whenever something really stupid happens, he laughs during all of his games. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I I, I, I kind of, like I mostly agree, but I slightly disagree about Plup's like approach for that. Like I feel like in theory, if you can really just like take yourself out of the moment and not, you know, 
not obsess over how stupid an interaction was. Like, that's a good attitude to have. But I feel like sometimes when Plup does it, like, it's it's a really, like, wry or ironic kind of laugh where it's like, that's uh, awesome. yeah. what that's a stupid true. game. That's so, awesome. yeah. I, I think it's uh, a mix someone, for someone I think that does that, actually. Um, if you watch the sets between PP and Armada, sometimes PP just gets something really dumb happens or Armada does something cool that also coincides with PP doing something dumb. Because uh, that's how Melee works. Um, but, like, some, he just, like... He laughs at himself, or like makes a funny face, know, right? Like, yeah, he makes a funny. You know that you all know the PP. Ah, oh, oh, shut! Yeah. You got this, right? We've yeah. all seen that, or the nodding, you know. Yeah. In the inside, I'm sure he's just as angry about it as all of us were <laughs> yeah. at some. But he's made peace with it, right? You you make yeah. peace with what's happening on the screen, no matter how much you hate it or how much you disagree. It is what's happening, and you just got to deal with it. And I think, like, the strategy in the inner game of tennis discussed on that was really you just have to, you have to avoid adding emotional attachment to everything that happens, right. because that's just really wasted brain effort. Like, yeah. the, because even if it's happiness, you're now wasting effort on thinking, oh, that was cool. You just want to see what happened, learn, like, process it, and move on with your life. And, like, every other thought is kind of pointless and we're not robots so we can't actually do that but that's that's the goal and then every time you have a, a feeling you should try and channel it to being good or ignore it those seem to be like the good strats mm -hmm. focusing on it and making it negative is definitely the worst plan yeah it's funny yeah, that Mewtwo that. King is the robot right that, that's his name <laughs> Because if you look at his face <laughs> and his party, Mango is, yeah. if anyone. He, yeah. or Armada, they're Armada's, so stoic. Armada's the robot. Cyborg Armada. I think Mango. Such, such Mango's really oh, stoic when he cool. plays too, though. Sometimes. He's either really stoic or really not stoic. But that's like when he's drunk and trolling or something. Sometimes he gets really frustrated. I've seen him get frustrated a few times. But yeah, most of the time he's more of a robot. But like, like Armada does too. But he probably plays Hungry Box. Yeah. <laughs> Every time he gets hit, it's such a great scowl. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Sorry, Tim. I think we. Okay, you no, it wasn't very important. I was just saying that Armada is like definitely a cyborg. Uh, yeah, there's I, some I sort of enhancement he has. Yeah. Neural implants, <laughs> man. That guy's crazy. Oh. M2K <laughs> after a virus scan. <laughs> <laughs> Needs a system update. So funny. <laughs> oh my god. All right, I think it's about time for viewer questions. Um, I can't actually see the Twitch chat, so you can type awful things about me, and I won't know. But uh, everyone else can. So. Yeah. Someone better ask a good question this week. Yeah. yeah I actually don't check out Twitch week. chat, so <laughs> maybe maybe Theo or Keith, you guys can like pick out a few yeah. for us to discuss. I just okay. Pigeon says, I get frustrated playing against Falco. <laughs> that is not a question, but don't get frustrated. Just like you have lasers, they have lasers. It's just <laughs> a fun game of lots of lasers. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, yeah so everywhere. so PJ, like real talk, like, you know, Things in life get a lot better once you start viewing things as games. Like it's it's good to care about things. You're out of high school. <laughs> but like no, like even in high school, you can like view classes and like getting into college is just like a big game, and that there are different strategies to like achieve your goals. But you know, even in Smash, like it's at the end of the day, even if it's something that frustrates you, just remember that it's a game, and that things can be a lot better, like depending on just your mindset. Wait, so let's get some actual questions. I'm wondering where to. <laughs> okay. What if you don't wanna? Guess I'll check in a little bit. Yeah, let's see. Uh, got a few people. Uh, question time. Thanks, Theo. <laughs> um, in the meantime, okay, well, let's comment on another comment while we wait yeah. for a question. So, so last week, um, what was it? There was a, a conversation about flow that we had. That I feel like some people think we didn't do justice. Oh, uh, I, I actually well, had. had we have one opinions. of those people on the call right now. So, Keith, what, what yeah. do you think about that? Okay, well, first I thought that some of the discussions on the flow were dumb. Uh, uh, okay. As in... <laughs> sorry, I was kind of blunt. Uh, uh, so... I... Wait, can we, can we like pose a specific question? Because I have a number of thoughts, but I want to make sure we keep it focused. So, can okay. we, we like pick How do you, so why do you away? think that flow... Oh. Asking if people should try and be in flow more often is a bad question. I mean, because obviously, like, <laughs> well, 
You had something about that, didn't well, you? Well, no, there was more the idea, there was the idea of, like, whether you should push yourself in and out of flow. I don't think you okay. consciously just be like, oh, I'm in flow now, oh, wait, they did something <laughs> that doesn't fit with my general pattern recognition abilities. I'm going to switch out of flow and go into active thinking mode. Like, it's not, you know, like, they're not, A, they're not that discreet, and B, you're not going to be that fluid during a game. Um... I also think that it's important not to be like, oh, I'm only going to play well if I'm in this one zone because you're not going to be in that zone all the time. And I also think this goes back to like a general opinion about like practicing melee. An understated like skill and important thing is your floor ability. I think people your baseline are, right. People yeah. overstate your big wins, and no one talks about your loss like people's losses as much. I think on a national level, people aren't like you know people always talk about oh who are their big wins, and I'm talking about who are their worst losses as often. Um, and I also think, I don't know, there was, there was one question that really bothered me of, like, what if your flow doesn't beat their flow? <laughs> Which is just dumb, because you don't know if you're in flow, and you don't know if the other person's in flow, because it's, like, a general concept. Um, and so I think it's, like, while, like, that's an important thing to think about, you shouldn't be constantly, like, creating something like, oh, I have to be in flow, because I think, I, I just think that's a really weird and dangerous road to go on. It's also very nebulous, and it's just not, I don't know. It doesn't, mm, it just rose me the wrong way. I, I'd like to challenge that concept of you don't know when you're in flow. Um, I think that for a lot of people, they know when they're on, right? Like, you know when someone's feeling themselves when you watch them on stream. And I think sometimes they know themselves that they're feeling themselves, right? Like, we, we all have that moment of like, damn, I'm going to do this and it's going to work, right? Like, we all, we all have that feeling. Right, but so I don't I, think that you... Sorry, go on. And I, I just think that sometimes you know if you're if you're in tune with yourself and with your character and with your opponent. And, like, even if they're beating you, um, like, you can be playing your best and they're beating you. Um, I think that that st- doesn't mean you're not in flow. That's just, just something you... That's just the way it is. Um, like, there's some t- some days. We all have these days. We've all had these days where you're just like, man, I'm playing terribly. It's the opposite of that, right? Like, it's the, oh, man, I'm playing super well moment. Yeah, I mean, I have a, f- a few comments, I guess, in response to that. I think one is that oftentimes people are way too results-oriented in how they judge their play, um, which obviously does not mean that what you're saying is not the case. I'm just saying that often it's not the case in practic- practicality with people. Um, also, I think when you're feeling that way, you're just feeling that way. And also, like, I don't think, oh, I'm definitely in flow state right now. Like, I'm just, like, in the moment, I'm just like, oh, I'm playing well. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. You know, I'm just doing what I'm doing, right? And so, you know, it's like, it's not something you would ever consciously think about, like, during a game or set, I guess, in a sort of way. And I also feel, you know, it's not like, because, like, a flow state is not a, like, well-defined specific thing in such that you would, like, identify it in a self-conscious and self-aware manner. Like, during, like, in the moment. Like, I can say, like, what I have, I, the way I feel is, like, afterwards, I'll be like, wow, like, that felt like I was in flow state. I was playing really well. This is how I was feeling during, you know, like, this is how I was feeling while I was playing. This, you know, but I don't think I'd, I don't, I just don't think I'd ever use that sort of influence how yeah. I think about the game. As well as so, happening. going back to one of your points earlier about, like, having a good baseline, I don't know if you guys have done this before, but watching videos where you don't think you were playing amazingly can actually be really illuminating because like a lot of yeah. the times like you're actually capable of a lot more creativity than than you thought so maybe sometimes like in, in slower matchups like shoot jigglypuff or something if you just look at the matchup like you'd be like oh this is probably just like a long game of like zoning and and, and camping right but like you can discover tons of interactions where you're like wow that was like a really cool thing i did even though i didn't feel like it was a fast-paced match or that i was in flow so having a good yeah. baseline and like sort of like understanding that you don't need to be playing your absolute best at melee in order to be able to produce good melee is important so that all just like ties back to like self-confidence mm-hmm. yeah i 100 percent agree with that i think okay. that sorry go on. we got a really good question from the chat um <laughs> finally uh so this is to each of the panelists this is from our very own uh, big blue esports half oh. oh. so this is a, a a very important question um for each of you... Oh my um, god, stop trolling out. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is your favorite fast food? Oh. 
Oh God, who so wait, cares? We were, I was gonna say we were. I was initially was brought on to talk about the fast. <laughs> this is the reason we have Keith on because here. people right, do right. not know. I think about me and my talents. My true talent <laughs> has nothing to do with chess or League of Legends or melee. It's my ability to put down food. I have actually won multiple fast food eating competitions. I've won money from this. Are you serious? I am a hundred percent serious. Off the stream now. You don't want to hear this. It's I weird. actually. I actually teamed with another Tufts Melee player, and we won the, a Dunkin' Donuts Munchkin eating competition at Tufts and won $50 from it. And so I had about 45 Munchkins in like an hour, and then I actually went to Autos and had a super case deal like an hour later. It was great. I had probably had like 6,000 calories that day. Um, oh I've also God. done a McDonald's eating competition with friends and had about 3,000 calories of McDonald's in a sitting. It was just two what countless. is 3,000 calories at McDonald's? It was about like? uh, two McChickens, two McDoubles, a Big Mac, uh, about 10 chicken McNuggets, uh, medium fries, a medium soda, and a large Oreo McFlurry, and like maybe something else. And, and a side wow. order of self-hatred. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. No, that's the main course. <laughs> All right, so I guess with our, with our time remaining, let's just like quickly get to it. Like, um, what, are, what are our favorite, like... Fast food places. How about this? Like, choose one place that you like the most, and one place that other people like that you hate. Ooh, ooh I like it. I like it. Okay. Right. I like that. Yeah. Who's starting? I'll go Theo, first. Go. All right. Let's so go my Theo. favorite is probably Qdoba. Oh my God! Yeah. Screw you, Theo. You, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Qdoba. God damn it. <laughs> well, you said too. Okay. I also really like McDonald's breakfast sandwiches. Those okay. Are good too. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Worst is a. Uh, I hate Wendy's. Everyone else loves it. Whoa! It's so bad. Yo, <laughs> remove Theo. Remove Theo yeah. from the call. Oh my god. Remove, remove Theo, Theo from Big Blue Esports, more like. Oh Once my I had god. A, I no, had more squib. no more BBS squib. No more BBS squib. Yeah, that, that, that emoticon's like going Once down. Once I had a Baconator and it was sick for like a month. It's oh my so god. You have a weak stomach. You have <laughs> a weak stomach. <laughs> Yeah, why don't you go back to Canada and eat poutine? Oh my they have god. Goodness. Wendy's there too, and it's just as bad. Ugh. Tien. Okay, so the one place that I really hate oh, that other people that other right. people seem to like a lot is is fucking Five Guys. Like, how is this oh, even like? How is this even like? How is this even like up for debate? God. Five Guys just like, like all right. I've probably been to like over oh. twenty Five Guys in my life, just growing up in New York and like going around in areas. There, I have never actually had a good Five Guys experience. The first yeah. bite is like okay, but everything past that point is just agonizing. So my pick for like my favorite fast food joint. Chick fil A. That place sustained me for like four years of college. We had the only Chick fil A in New York, and I went to that place religiously. <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. Best Good burgers. Stuff. Good stuff. Our very own Mizu got banned from Armada's. I don't know if banned, but no, completely almost got banned by Armada. Um, Armada's stream for saying that he hates Five Guys. So shout us to almost you. Almost got banned. <laughs> wow, I didn't know Armada's like tastes were so shit. Oh, so <laughs> this oh is my wrong. god. Oh my god. That was mine too. Oh, it was disgusting. Wait, so Howard, what's your favorite place? And then I'll My go. We have a super favorite. legitimate question after. We have a super legitimate question. So Yeah, and we'll, we will close with that question. But my absolute favorite, that they're, the closest one is in Worcester, so it's like far as heck, is Arby's. Um, and Arby's is amazing. For, for those of you that haven't had their chicken bacon <sighs> something, I don't know. It's delicious. It's Seriously, dude? Um, chicken bacon Swiss. It's so good! Dude, it's, I thought Arby's was like one step above like... TGI Fridays are like. Oh, uh, TGI Fridays is gross. But Arby's right. is amazing. You have to get you have to get only their chicken bacon Swiss and their curly fries. If you get anything else, it's bottom tier. But those two, <laughs> those two items completely carry the menu. We'll have to try. We'll have to try that out sometime. That sounds awesome. It's all good chicken bacon. Right. Um, and and overrated. Well, you took mine. Five Guys is absolutely the worst. I would like almost mention it again. But uh, what else is? We're like five that? gross. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna. This isn't exactly fast food per se, but if you try to ever take me to an Applebee's, I will disown you as a friend. Like that's that's the the worst. It's like we had Olive Garden to that. Oh, oh gross enough to be Olive fast Garden. food, but without any of the benefits, and it pretends to be a real restaurant. And it's disgusting. Okay. All right. Uh, so yeah, I, will, I will say also, I did prepare for this podcast. I had McDonald's for dinner today, which I haven't done in a long time. I had, to, I had to get myself in the right place. You're a disgusting um, human being. <laughs> I will say, actually, so shout out to Piwoo, who both asked a legitimate question and understands me because he's from Seattle. The best fast food place in the world is Dick's. It's a local Seattle chain made by a guy named Richard, uh, who actually died recently. Oh. Um, 
Shout out to him. Amazing. It has the best burgers I've ever had. It's cheaper. Amazing double cheese, like deluxe double cheeseburgers for $3 each. They have their own homemade ice cream, best fries. They make their milkshakes there with their homemade ice cream, and their milkshakes are $2.50. Incredible. It's amazing. It, I, it's actually, and it's actually the best quality fast food I've ever had. How does this stack up to In N Out? I've actually never had In N Out because uh, it's, it's difficult. In N Out is my favorite burger chain, but yeah, I will say I think it's, it's better than any burger chain I've had. Um, out of the more standard ones, I'll say overrated, even though it's low rated, is also Burger King. Burger King is lowly rated and still overrated. <laughs> 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 and I will say, I actually, I love Wendy's. I think I'm going to get the, uh, Wendy's has by far the best value menu. I will say it is decreased. It's not as good. I will say the golden era of Wendy's was from 2010 when the double stack was $1. Oh my god. <laughs> it will <laughs> never be as good of a $1 item in the world we as a double, like the double stack. in chilies with chili oh. seasoning. Oh that's my lunch. god. Yeah. So that, okay. those are my answers. So, so moving on to the last question of the night. Um, this one's floated by Piwu. Um, he asks, how do you prepare for tournament nerves if you aren't able to go to tournaments right now? Um, so, I yeah. Thoughts on this? If, uh, other people can go first. I don't really care. Or I can. I, I can always go to tournaments very often, so I don't think I have very much to add to this. Okay. What about nationals? We don't go to nationals very often. There's got to be something applicable. I have a really general answer, to be honest. Okay. I, I can go for that. I, I guess also I guess goes back to like across different games because I've, mm -hmm. I've felt different sorts of nerves across different games based on the individual game. And I think the thing that I always do is I think um, I it goes back to a lot of what I was talking about before. I actually think I really think it's like self introspection is the is the best way to go about it because I think everyone gets nervous for slightly different reasons, and so I think that figuring out why you get nervous because it's usually like sub some some subconscious thought pattern or, like, feeling or value system you have that goes on. Like, oh, I shouldn't lose this person. Oh, I don't want to lose. And then you play terribly because you're worried about losing. Um, and so figuring out where your nerves come from and then thinking about those reasons and then realizing that they're stupid and don't matter is usually... And I think that's, like, a good starting point. Because, like, who cares if you lose to one dude who's considered worse to you once if you're improving along the Like, it doesn't matter. And, you know, as an example. So I, I have a pretty weird piece of advice that may or may not be helpful depending on who you are. But um, I used to get like pretty nervous about these sorts of things. Um, like I used to do cello recitals back in the day or whatnot uh, and whatnot. But if you ever just go out and do something, that'll just like ruin your day, right? And you fail at it, right? Like just go out and like just really screw up. <laughs> Right. <laughs> After that, you just don't get nervous anymore. Like it's it's yeah, weird it's to say. Weird. It's really weird to say. But like, if you just go and do something that you'll really regret, right? Like just don't <laughs> you do that. Well, like like, like, like what if it's right? Like melee is super important to all of us that play this game, right? But I'm sure that it's not the singular most important thing in your life. Like probably not. So if you go out and do something, speak for really yourself, important. Howard. Okay, maybe not for team. <laughs> But for most of people, it's like, go do, like, I don't know, asking a girl out on a date. Go get shot down horribly. Go do something <laughs> that, like, put a oh, in your stomach God. and get rejected. Like, go do something, like, whatever. It, it, it matters a ton in the moment. Like, at the moment, you're like, you, you're the feeling in your stomach is the worst feeling in the world. But, like, once you do it and you have some time to process it, it might take, like, a couple of years of crying over a pill, whatever. But once you get over it, it's like... Once you get to the next time it happens, it just won't be as bad. And it's like a. Oh, sorry. So, yeah. I see alternatively, you can just lose to someone really bad in melee and then realize it'll never be that bad again. You know, <laughs> like you can just just have one awful experience. Like, like the first time I lost a Howard in tournament. I'm joking, I don't actually remember the wow! Howard tournament. Um, <laughs> nothing will ever be that bad again. Uh, sick burn, bro. Ooh. Yeah, sorry Ooh. you got bodied, bruh. <laughs> so the question was like about like how you can prepare for tournaments if you don't get opportunities to go to tournaments very often, right? Um, I think the best thing you can, the best things that you can do, uh, have to do with expectation management. Yeah. So if you go to tournaments like very infrequently and you understand that other people are working harder than you and also um, getting more opportunities to play, 
they are just going to be naturally more favored to do well than you are. That's not to say that you can't make upsets, but you, you should like not be hard on yourself in advance, and you shouldn't think about results too much before you even play the matches. All of that will just distract you. So um, with regards to that, like just do something that really will get your endorphin levels up. Like I prefer, I, I actually care a lot about gymming before I do big events. So before nationals, like for an entire week, I'll, I'll be hitting the gym. And before podcasting, I always gym so that like I can feel high energy and really like sharp. Um, but with regards to like not going to tournaments very often, just feel good about yourself. You know, realize that like you, your results don't reflect your self worth, and you know just go to a tournament and have fun rather than thinking about what people will think of you. Okay, I think that about wraps it up. Um, does anyone want to shout out anyone before we close up the show? Shout outs to everyone who's been watching my stream. <laughs> Keep are, watching are we my stream. Streaming after? Uh, shout outs to Rhyme stream. for Rhyme Facts. <laughs> yes, Rhyme Facts, the uh, legendary. Oh it's going to be like streaming like more after, after this. Yeah, you Theo should. and I will be playing after this. Yeah, come, come watch the watch stream. That. Come interact. Come hang out with us. Um, I uh, would like to shout out Ryan Romanos or Kunai for not only having the most beautiful voice I've ever listened to, but just being just the, the coolest all around homie. So, so shout outs to him. Dude, that guy was the greatest wingman for all the songs that we did in karaoke this weekend. Yeah, if you put a good song on and you were passionate about it, he was going to join you. Like He's there for you. Doesn't matter up. if he doesn't know the words, he'll be there. He will yeah. hum for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to say thank you to all of you guys for having me on the show, also. Thanks, guys. And thanks to you. Thank for you coming. for playing Sheik for so long. <laughs> <laughs> with it. I love it. No, I'll yeah, thank you. you. I'll thank you for that. My <laughs> Region needs more cheeks. Yep, um, my shoutouts are going to be to the out-of-region players. We didn't really get to talk about this very much, but there is so much value to having out-of-region experience being brought to, like, you know, a, a, like a regional tournament, which is like Mass Madness. Um, you really get to learn about more styles, and you get to really test people based on what works in your region, and you get to really collide that against what other players have found to be working for them. So huge shout outs to Rio Butte, Smuckers, and Discid Boogie in particular, as well as all the people who, who traveled along with them, like Mr. F. Um, we got we got like a lot of out of you know out of region players and really you can appeal to like players of all levels. But ultimately, you know, it benefits both parties immensely when these guys come out. And I'm sure, you know, like I hope you guys had a great time and we hope to be hearing from them sometime soon. <laughs> we hope to see them sometime soon. All right. All right. I think that's about it for this week, right? Any last words you guys want to talk about? Nah, we're good. Thanks Bye. for tuning in, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for, seeing, thanks for com coming by. See you guys next week. See you guys. Yeah, have a good night. <laughs>